Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us here this afternoon uh, virtually at the Leventhal Mappen Education Center. I'm Garrett Dash Nelson. I'm the president and head curator at the center. Uh, and we're so glad to see you all today, uh, whether you're joining us at 1 p.m. from Brighton or whether it's 1 a.m. and you're on the other side of the globe and you just happen to be really curious about Brighton. Uh, we've got a great event planned today that's going to be led um, by one of our newest staff members at the MAP Center, Ian Spangler, who is our new assistant curator for digital and participatory geography. Hi, Ian. Hi, Garrett. Uh, so excited to be here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to taking you all on a little map tour of Brighton today. Great. And also on the video today is Megan Nally, who's one of our gallery attendants um, and public engagement coordinator here at the MAP Center. Megan does great work working with the public on all sorts of different topics. Uh, you can see her at our free exhibition hall, which is open six days a week at the Central Library in Copley Square. And we've currently got a show called Bending Lines, Maps and Data from Distortion to Deception Up. Hi, Megan. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Great, so we're gonna turn it over to Ian, um, who's gonna lead you through today's talk. Um, and then we'll join later uh, in the presentation for the Q&A session. Uh, and we'll also be joined by Dove from the Brighton Branch Library of the BPL um, to share some resources that the Branch Library has as well. So thanks and Ian, take it away. Great, uh, thanks so much, Garrett. Um, I'd like to start off today uh, by just taking note of the complicated and contested threads that are woven through uh, the historical geographies that we inhabit here in Boston. Um, that includes difficult stories that we neither can nor should ignore. Um, the place that we call Boston is the ancestral and current home of indigenous people, including the Mashpee and the Aquina Wampanoag tribes, uh, the Nipah nations, uh, and descendants of the Massachusetts people. Uh, Copley Square, uh, where the BPL is located, sits on top of a filled tidal estuary that once featured some of the most advanced marine agricultural techniques in North America. The maps that we have here in the BPL bear history not only to the indigenous expropriation, but also to other conflicts ranging from labor struggles uh, to racial segregation. Uh, in many cases, the maps that we have don't just document those stories, but they actually play a role in making them happen in the first place. Um, and, and that's a huge part of what the exhibition that uh, is, is on right now at, at uh, the Leventhal Center Bending Lines uh, tries to discuss and investigate. Um, and really in all the programs that we host at the Leventhal Map and Education Center, we encourage people to think about how those histories are, are very much with us in the present day. So keeping that in mind, um, we here at the Leventhal Map Center are an independent nonprofit. Uh, we're based in the Boston Public Library out of Copley. Um, it's a public-private relationship with the center uh, in the city of Boston. Uh, and, and basically we steward one of the most important map collections in North America. Um, we have a world-class collection of cartographic objects uh, that tell the story of Boston, New England, uh, and beyond. Our maps range uh, all, across, um, <clears throat> all across the world. And this includes flat maps, rolled maps, globes, uh, stick charts, and more. Um, we'd encourage anybody who's interested in looking at these collections to come by and visit us uh, six days a week uh, to see the gallery um, or work with us more individually on any research projects, reference appointments uh, that you would like to, that you're curious about uh, with physical maps uh, or our digital geospatial data. Um, we work with all kinds of historic collections and present day maps, uh, and we always welcome folks from all walks of life uh, to join us in looking through these wonderful documents. Um, so uh, that being said, uh, we are uh, very committed to making these uh, data and these maps available uh, to the public at no cost. Um, we rely largely on contributions from viewers like you to to support our programs here at the LMAC. So um, if you enjoy this event, uh, please consider donating at leventhalmap.org slash donate. Um, even a small donation helps to support our uh, free and public mission. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, one, one other thing to keep in mind, um, as, uh, as we go through this presentation, uh, the folks here at the LMAC uh, are not uh, 
expert historians. Uh, we're not uh, supposed to be, nor do we try to be. Um, but we are equipped to talk about some of the impacts that maps and map making have had in our world. So if you have questions, uh, if you have uh, thoughts or information that you think might enrich this conversation, I feel free to drop a chat, a message uh, in the chat on Facebook or YouTube. Um, Megan and Garrett will be helping to kind of screen those and manage them. And, and we'd love to get to those questions uh, towards the end of the Q&A here. Um, <clears throat> so I want to show, uh, I want to start by kind of bringing your attention to our website. This is where we host all of our uh, maps, um, all of our services and uh, collections. Um, a sizable number of our maps are digitized. You can visit our digital collections portal here for a glimpse of nearly 10,000 high quality scans of items in our catalog, all of which are deeply zoomable. Um, and if you, uh, if you start off, uh, we can just click over here to the search bar. And this will bring us to a search page in our collections where uh, you can uh, examine both the Leventhal Map Center and the Boston Public Library's uh, map objects. So we'll let it think for a second. Just in case it takes uh, a little bit longer, I do have some of the maps pulled up uh, in advance. Um, but I have the browser here just so I can show you, uh, you know, on your own time and uh, on your own schedule, how you could access some of these collections. Um, but why don't we just jump ahead into looking at some of these maps. Um, <clears throat> I want to start off by looking at uh, this wonderful map here, the city of Boston from 1879. Um, this is a pictorial or panoramic map of Boston. It's one of the earlier maps from a cartographer named uh, O.H. Bailey, who was a prolific author of these pictorial maps of New England. Um, he lived to the age of 104, so good for him. And this also allowed him to uh, create over 300 uh, of these bird's eye view maps. Um, if we click on this map here, it'll bring us to, it should bring us to, uh, there we go. Should bring us to a more zoomable uh, image. <laughs> of course, there are. Uh, it wouldn't. It wouldn't truly be a virtual online presentation if there weren't technical difficulties. Um, Ian, I wonder if the internet at Copley is uh, is is misbehaving. I I'm happy to pull up my screen share and you just tell me where you want to view. It, it, it would be ironic if my home internet is better than the uh, the Copley Square internet. Um, but do you want me do you want me to try and yeah. share my screen? Garrett, that would be great if you could. Um, yeah, I, it could be the internet, it could be my computer, but seems I'm just ha having a little bit of trouble here. Um, yeah, no worries. So could you, I've if had, you could pull I've up this, yeah. my internet in the library as well. So yes, I know exactly ma what map you're looking at, uh, luckily. So let me bring my screen over and then I'll be quiet and you just tell me what you wanna, what you wanna look at. Great, that's yeah. perfect. Thanks, Garrett. All right. You look at All right. Screen. Great. Perfect. Um, so we've got this wonderful, uh, intricately detailed bird's eye view map of the city of Boston. Uh, this map uh, is positioned as though you're looking uh, sort of north uh, northwest. Um, and, and this is one of the more detailed bird's eye view maps that we see even compared to the ones that came before. Um, these were common ways of imagining what the city looks like from above at this time. Uh, of course, nobody really knows uh, in the late 1800s what a bird's eye view of the city of Boston uh, looks like, um, setting aside maybe some sophisticated balloons. Um, there's no aerial photography. Uh, you would make a map like this from uh, consolidating and collecting existing plats and survey maps um, and, and carefully speculating about what 
uh, what the city might look like from above. Um, <clears throat> this map is indexed for points of interest in Boston, Garrett, if you could go down to that legend for me. Um, <clears throat> this is how artists would uh, draw these maps and uh, acquire funding basically by offering subscriptions to different organizations like churches and businesses, um, even private residences. And then those organizations would get their buildings represented on a bird's eye view map. So we see here um, Trinity Church, uh, Old South Church. If you could scroll over to the right hand uh, of the legend Garrett, we'll see a lot of uh, rail railway and transportation uh, organizations represented here. Uh, the DOs represent district offices. Um, and looking back to the map, uh, it's kind of hard to track these numbers down uh, because the map is so detailed, uh, but they are uh, scattered all across it. Let's jump over to the BPL, um, if you could. Uh, this is an interesting uh, little selection because uh, of course this map in 1879, the BPL did not exist yet. Um, it's across the street from Old South Church and Trinity which loom large in the landscape already having been built just a few years before. Um, at this time, we're right on the heels uh, and really in the thick of the Back Bay infill project that I'll talk more a little bit uh, about later. If you could go to the wharf, Garrett, um, this map is really detailed along the coast. Uh, wharfs are individually labeled. Um, and if you zoom in a little more closely, you'll see the text right along these uh, carefully drawn boats. Um, obviously, this is something that the that uh, OH uh, Bailey was very careful to represent. On the flip side, uh, zooming back out, and Garrett, if you can go to the upper left-hand side of the map, we'll see that Brighton is quite abstract and not very detailed at all. In 1879, Brighton had just been incorporated a few years before into the city of Boston. It was annexed in, in uh, 1874. So <clears throat> this is all very new territory for the city of Boston. And it'll be easier in some ways uh, to get away from this bird's eye view map and drill down to some of the maps that we actually do have of Brighton in our collection. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Garrett, could you jump back to our digital collections portal and just search for Brighton so that we can get a sense of uh, the coverage of the maps that, uh, that appear in the collections? So here in our digital collections portal, it's very easy to access this. Um, and if memory serves, we have about 29 maps uh, that, that pop up uh, when you search for Brighton in the collections. Uh, <clears throat> we have a range of maps from parks to atlases. Um, not all of these are actually maps of Brighton in Boston, uh, but uh, you can uh, isolate by different kinds of geographies uh, or time periods with the little search bars on the left uh, to specify your search more deeply. Um, you'll note if you could scroll down to, this, to the timeline uh, for me, Garrett, you'll note that the uh, majority of the maps that we have of Brighton are really after Brighton was annexed into the city of Boston. That said, we do have a couple of really interesting maps from when Brighton was its own independent town. And I wanna start by just pulling up this great mill dam survey, survey um, that one on the bottom middle, Garrett. There you go. So this is a great map of, um, uh, it's a manuscript map, which means it was hand drawn uh, and uh, in ink and watercolor. Um, you'll see Brighton up there at the top. Uh, again, this is not uh, necessarily a map that focuses on Brighton. Um, another example of how some of the metadata of, of, uh, of how we catalog our maps um, gets searched and returned in our digital collections. But I do think this is a great place to start. Um, the Mill Dam was an engineering project in the Back Bay that started in about 1814. Um, and it's one of the oldest corporations established in Massachusetts. Um, it was a giant commercial failure. Uh, you can see on this map that proposed roads, if you go down to the Back Bay area, Garrett, um, proposed roads have been sketched out over the tidal basin in the Back Bay. Um, these are uh, roads that would be built after the infill project in the Back Bay was completed. Um, and it was underway at this point, but uh, not finished entirely. Uh, the Mill Dam Corporation folded in the late 1850s, around when this map was made, 
and that's when they sold the rights to the Back Bay Land Reclamation Project, which of course completes uh, filling it in later on. Um, this map may have been part of that transaction process. I'm not entirely sure. I don't think that we have a creator listed for it, but it is a really fascinating uh, and quite a lovely map um, from the collections. Uh, and while this map is really interesting, a lot of the maps that we have from the time period when Brighton was its own town are just from real estate auctions. Um, Garrett, if you could pull up the uh, th this map, I will drop it in the link or in the chat if that helps. It's a map of a uh, plan of 82 building lots in Brighton. Yep, that's the one. Um, so lots of the maps from this time are real estate auction maps, uh, just like this one. Uh, these are often called broadside maps. So what broadside maps are, the, these refers, the, this refers to maps that are printed just on one side and served mainly as promotional materials for real estate auction houses. Um, so these maps are meant to highlight and appeal to uh, folks who are interested in buying property. Uh, this one is from the sale, uh, sale of the estate of uh, Samuel Bigelow, it looks like. And uh, Bigelow is still represented in the landscape of Brighton today. Bigelow Street is, uh, is still named uh, in, this, uh, in this neighborhood here. Um, broadside maps and real estate auction maps are a really interesting uh, example of something that in the moment was simply an advertising tool or a promotional tool that kind of cataloged what was available for people to buy. Nowadays, these maps can serve as a, an effective research tool that can reflect on how property ownership was changing over the time and what effect that had on the shape that the urban landscape was actually taking uh, in Brighton and Boston more generally. Um, this map is from 1863, so it's still before Brighton is annexed, like I said. Um, let's jump ahead a little bit and take a look at a map that is right on the cusp of Brighton's annexation into Boston. Um, it's this plan of uh, the town of Brighton Garrett from 1873, if you have that handy. Perfect. Um, so this map of the plan of the town of Brighton predates the annexation by just one year. You'll note a few interesting features here. Um, let's go down to the reservoir and zoom in uh, on the bottom left. Um, the water features in this uh, map show some ponds and notably the Chestnut Hill Reservoir. Uh, the larger Bradley Basin is the only one that remains today. Um, and we'll explore that a little bit more later on. You'll also see if you could go down to, this, to the kind of central square, Garrett, um, some civic institutions uh, that are labeled on the map, including uh, you know, things like schools, libraries, churches, and the town hall, um, which again are all labeled here. Um, some business organizations, most notably the railroad station and something called the Cattle Fair Hotel, which many of you in Brighton may be familiar with. Um, the Cattle Fair Hotel is a really interesting inclusion. Um, it was founded in around 1830 uh, and Brighton's cattle market was a mainstay of the town's economy and culture dating back to the late 18th century. Um, this is something that uh, was really interesting to find represented in different kinds of cartographic materials that we have in the collection. Um, the cattle and slaughterhouse industry was so significant in Brighton uh, that Andrew Robichaud, a professor at Boston University, has called Brighton an animal suburb. Um, in the 1860s, about 500,000 livestock were passing through Brighton every year. And uh, you might think that that was kind of annoying uh, and smelly. And it was according to all of the, uh, all of the history that we can ascertain of the time period. Uh, residents of Brighton would often file complaints under nuisance laws uh, of the day, but courts often gave preference to the party that was first present in these cases. So uh, Brighton slowly develops over the years into a sort of nuisance zone in which animal production and consumption uh, for the greater Boston area was confined. Um, and this shapes the way that people settle and that different kinds of urban development happen in the area. Um, eventually the stockyards and the slaughterhouses in Brighton will get migrated closer up to the river, but this map is from 1873 and that hasn't happened yet. So again, we'll revisit that in a little bit. Let's jump over to a couple more maps. I would love to take a look at the Brighton Park District, Garrett. Um, 
this is, uh, yep, this one. Um, this is a map that shows some park districts in, in Boston's new neighborhood of Brighton. This is an 1876 map. So it does, uh, it, it, this is after Brighton has been annexed into the city of Boston. Um, it's a map from the park department that highlights green space at the expense of other details on the map, such as things like land ownership and building type. Um, you'll note we can actually see if you zoom into the top right hand corner, a pair of churches at the top, although they're unlabeled. Those are churches that we could see on the plan of Brighton map. And just across the street uh, at the corner of Washington and Market, I believe, um, is where the Cattle Fair Hotel is, but is not shown on the map. So um, so that is just a, an interesting uh, example of the sorts of exclusions that cartographers and map makers have to make, depending on what the topic that we're that we're looking at is. Um, Finally, so I want to segue out of our little map tour here with one final real estate map. Um, it's an 1890 map uh, of a, another plan of houses at Oak Square. Um, this is, uh, do you have that one handy, Garrett? I don't you might think have so. to type in. Can you tell me what, what to look for? Yeah. Uh, just there plan of house right. lots at, uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. So this is, um, this is another real estate auction map, um, that, uh, shows, uh, the Oak Square area of the neighborhood of Brighton. Um, again, from 1890, after it's been annexed into the city of Boston, um, this doesn't, while it tells us some interesting things, uh, addresses, parcel boundaries, the author of the map, John McCormick. Um, was a real estate uh, agent in the late 1800s. Um, we get some interesting uh, basic information, but this doesn't tell us a lot about context, right? How the space has changed over time, how this real estate map was related to the places around it. This can be really hard to do with static maps uh, that we have to cross-reference and make a lot of inferences from. So to answer some of those tougher questions, uh, at the Leventhal Center, we've developed a tool called Atlascope. Um, so I'd love to, to jump over into Atlascope, if you could uh, boot that up, Garrett. Um, <clears throat> one of the interesting collections that we have here at the MAP Center is a collection that we call Real Estate and Fire Insurance Atlases. These atlases, which are big bound books of map sheets covering entire cities, uh, were extremely detailed, um, much more detailed than the little real estate auction maps that I've shown you before. Um, and that's because they were uh, an important way of answering some key questions in the 19th and 20th centuries. Namely, what is the risk exposure of insuring a building? And for tax assessment purposes, who, who owns that building? Um, on the one hand, we have a, a large set of Sanborn fire insurance maps that were created for those fire insurance policies. Um, and those show uh, careful details about building dimensions, uh, building size, uh, building uh, material and different street names. So those have ended up being uh, invaluable historic uh, and research materials. On the other hand, we have Brom. different huntize them and we put them into this tool called atlascope which you can access online for free um, in atlascope those old atlases are overlaid on a modern map of boston allowing you to take a walk through how the city has grown and changed so garrett let's jump ahead to the boston public library in atlascope and just take a look um, at the tool um, so this is what atlascope looks like you'll see um, the modern base map there on the bottom and then this little glass uh, slider here in the middle um, is revealing uh, an 1874 uh, map. I think that this one is a Hopkins map. Um, I can't remember. Uh, so it's revealing uh, a historic atlas of Boston that, uh, that we have digitized and overlaid on the modern map. Um, you'll notice that the BPL did not exist yet in this 1874 map. Of course, at this time, the Back Bay neighborhood was still very new and being filled in. Um, let's jump ahead to 1883. Uh, by 1883, we can see that the land has been dedicated 
to the city of Boston, uh, where the public library uh, will eventually be built. And by 1890, the building footprint is there. So we can see the modern uh, McKim building with the courtyard um, uh, there at the Boston Public Library. Uh, the, this 1890 map is a Bromley real estate map that shows building material and ownership. Uh, the Boston Public Library, of course, is built. Um, it's brown uh, represented, uh, which it's brown, uh, which represents the stone, uh, the stonework and the stone construction. If you hop over there across the street next to the old uh, South Church, you'll see that a lot of those buildings are in pink, which means that they were, I believe, wooden structures with some stone facades on the outside. You can also see that a lot of the names of uh, folks who owns those buildings, uh, property owners are listed here. Um, so, so we can walk through all the way to 1938 uh, with this tool uh, and see the kinds of transformations that have happened uh, in the city, both here uh, at the Boston Public Library and across Boston. Um, if you wanna, if you wanna jump uh, all the way out there. Um, could you zoom so that we just see the uh, the boundaries of the atlases? So the process of making this tool is pretty labor intensive. Um, it requires digitizing 100 atlases, uh, loading each individual map uh, page into a geographic information system and saying, hey, this corner on a Sanborn map or a Bromley map is the same as this street corner in the real world. Uh, this is a process known as georeferencing, um, and it's how we made Atlas Scope. Uh, so zooming out far enough, you can see that these are all the uh, footprints of the whole atlases. Uh, the green polygons represent uh, one, and each, each one represents one of about 100 uh, atlases that we've digitized and georeferenced here. So this is probably a good time to to jump back in to some of those maps that I discussed above uh, using Atlas Scope. So let's start off by doing a little bit of hunting here for interesting, uh, interesting things that those other maps we looked at missed. Um, Garrett, could you go into the search bar and just search for Oak Square? So searching Oak Square here, uh, this is all plugged into a, to a modern mapping uh, search system that will bring us, once we click on that, to the Oak Square part of uh, the Brighton neighborhood. Starting in 1875, uh, Atlas Scope always defaults to the first, the earliest map tile uh, that we have for that area. Um, you can see the names of property owners, which would become the names of the streets in this subdivision. So zoom out just a bit, Garrett, and uh, Look, uh, there we go. Uh, Champney and Shed, I think that is. Um, it's a little hard, hard to see on my screen. So, yep, Shed, there we go. Um, so, if we were to toggle back and forth between this map uh, and the real estate auction map from earlier, we'll note that there's a Shed Street and a Champney Street that, that both end up emerging a couple years later. If you skip ahead to 1890, uh, you'll see that the property parcels have finally uh, been divided, but they've not necessarily been sold yet. Uh, the 1890 map of this area looks a lot more familiar to that real estate map, the auction map that we looked earlier, uh, that we visited earlier. And you'll see that the, the street names have been listed out. And even some buildings are appearing. Um, jumping ahead to 1889, uh, parcels have been sold. They're beginning to be partitioned up. Uh, and we see a lot of different structures emerging on these on these parcels. So this is just an example of how you can take um, some of the static maps that might not be a part of Atlas Scope as a jumping off point to explore different things uh, about how the city has changed. Um, <clears throat> this is the 1890 map uh, of Oak Square that I'm referencing here. Uh, John. Uh, what was his name? John McCarthy. I think the real estate agent, um, and he had, uh, you know, he he basically. Um, there we go. Uh, if we pulled that map back up, we could even go visit his office, um, which is at twenty three Court Street. So, uh, Garrett, why don't you type twenty three Court Street into? Uh, the Atlas Scope search tool and just see if we can't uh, track down 
uh, John J. McCormick. That was his name, John McCormick's uh, office. Um, so it's in the, I think the Adams building and it should be right there in the middle of uh, this cluster uh, to the north of Court Street. And it might be 1861 is probably a little early. Um, <clears throat> Why don't we jump ahead to, there we go. Um, yeah, so we'll see the Adams building right there. This is where the real estate agent who uh, developed that neighborhood in Brighton was working at the time. Um, and this is just, uh, you know, this is a, one of the connections that you can draw between the materials that we have uh, between Atlas Scope and some of the other static maps in our collection. Um, if you go back to Oak Square, Garrett, um, that real estate map uh, from John McCormick is actually right next to the 1863 one uh, that I had pulled up earlier. Um, go ahead and, uh, and punch Oak Square back into the search bar. And if we pop back over to that part of Brighton uh, and just scroll north a little bit, you'll see uh, a little north and a little east for me. Yes, so this um, this part, uh, yep, this is exactly it. Uh, this is the real estate auction map that uh, I first showed you at the beginning of this talk. So zoom in just a little bit and we'll see that um, this neighborhood is mostly owned by the same person. Uh, Garish, I think is George Garish. Uh, looks like he owns a huge uh, portion of the property in this neighborhood. So we can assume that this might've been a developer might have been a landlord, uh, someone who certainly had a lot of access to capital at the time. And if we just jump ahead to 1890, um, we can start to see how these property parcels are or are not uh, being divided, um, how different buildings are being constructed along these plots. Uh, let's do one more here. Here. Um, let's jump back to our park map of the reservoir uh, and maybe we can search for at the Evergreen Cemetery in Atlas Scope and just take a look at uh, that, that southwestern portion of Brighton where the re reservoir and the ponds are. So let's zoom out a little bit here and you'll see that in the Atlas Scope map, uh, we've got both of those uh, water bodies, right? The Chestnut Hill Reservoir. Um, which was a really important uh, water source for the neighborhood of Brighton at the time. And also a place where people could go for walks used as a, as a green space. This was both a utilitarian space and also a space for recreation. Uh, if you go ahead and drag the magnifying glass to be a little smaller, Garrett, um, you'll see that uh, in the modern map, Right, that smaller reservoir has now disappeared. Um, and we can see where the footprint of the previous reservoir has kind of informed the development of that neighborhood um, following some of the contours here. I'm gonna go ahead and show you one more thing before we turn this over to a, to a more uh, Q&A session. Um, let's jump over to the Cattle Fair Hotel and see if we can't find that on this uh, on Atlas Scope. The Cattle Fair Hotel should be uh, close to Brighton Square. Um, if memory serves. And in this neighborhood where the Cattle Fair Hotel is located, you'll notice that the Cattle Fair uh, Corporation owns a lot of different property in the neighborhood. Um, and again, they were uh, one of the second, maybe the second oldest. Yeah, so that, that's it. Um, I think we must be on maybe the 1890 map here. In 1890, the Cattle Fair Hotel was renamed to the Faneuil House. If you make it maybe 1885 even, it should show up as the Cattle Fair Hotel. Yep. Um, yeah, the Cattle Fair Corporation's Cattle Fair Hotel. Uh, so this is a part of the neighborhood that was largely um, largely influenced uh, by the cattle fair cattle fair corporation and the cattle market in Brighton. Um, the last thing I want to show us is just the stockyards. If you could scroll uh, zoom out a little bit for me, Garrett, and we're going to go uh, a bit to the northeast uh, over towards the railroads by the Charles River. 
and uh, go ahead and pull up. Yes, this is perfect. Um, so these are the stockyards. Uh, jump to the 1872 map for me, uh, if you if you would. Um, you'll see that in 1870 or 1875, excuse me. In 1875, the stockyards were not were not up here by the railroad. Um, they uh, at this time were somewhere else in the city. Um, but by 18 uh, 1880, I think um, the 1882 map should show the stockyards popping up here. Um, and this is part of a response to the different kinds of regulations that are being uh, kind of navigated at the time, right? Around how to manage uh, half a million uh, animals, half a million livestock uh, passing through Brighton uh, on an annual basis. Uh, how do you regulate that? Where do you put them? Uh, where where are you going to deal with uh, this huge uh, economic and logistical issue of uh, of slaughtering animals at scale? Uh, so Brighton is again uh, a central place uh, in this uh, sort of economic circuit. Um, I want to go ahead and pause there on uh, I guess a bit of a bit of a uh, a bit of a morbid note um, to bring uh, to bring Garrett and uh, Megan back to the screen. And, and maybe we can start a more interactive part of this. What we typically like to do here is just have folks um, chime in with an address, uh, maybe your house, maybe somewhere that you're curious to see how it's changed over time and, and sort of walk you through a live, uh, a live demo of, of how that is situated in Atlascope. Um, and also thank you, Garrett, for uh, accommodating my, uh, my poor internet today. I really appreciate the <laughs> moving through Atlascope for me. Yeah, thank you, Ian, for, for rolling with it and to our audience for bearing with us. Um, it's like we always have to have somebody in an off-site location just in case the, in the internet uh, gives us trouble. So um, yeah, Ian, I'll let you take uh, questions. Um, Meg and I are here too. Um, and like Ian said, we can search stuff on Atlascope. We can look at for other maps in the collections. Um, we're happy to answer all your questions. Uh, or zoom in on places that you all are interested in in Brighton and, and, and walk you through how to access our digital collections in different ways. All right, looks like we have someone asking to see 116 Murdoch Street. And I'll try it on the screen. One thing I'll remind everybody as I'm searching this, um, Ian mentioned it briefly, um, but these these address searches, of course, are searching modern street addresses and modern data. Um, the computer can't actually read the text that's in these historic maps, at least not yet. And so addresses change over time. Um, building names certainly change. You saw the Califair Hotel become um, the Faneuil Hotel. Uh, so we're searching right now where 116 Murdoch Street is today. And it may be that that historically has not changed very much, but especially when you get to downtown Boston, it's also worth keeping in mind that addresses have changed. And so what is today an address may be different from what that same address uh, was called in the past. This is kind of interesting. We just dropped down. Uh, I hope we're in about the right place uh, on, on modern Murdoch Street here. Um, but it looks like we're right uh, on a on a water course. Um, so probably a uh, now buried water course, which is quite, quite interesting. Um, I'm going to switch over. You can, you can compare not only to the modern street map, but also to a modern aerial map. So this blue dot is at 116 or close to 116 Murdoch. Um, and you can see this, this uh, brook running, where would this have run to? Down to the Charles, I guess. Um, do, 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 running all the way down here into the Charles River, uh, ran right through um, basically the corner of Murdoch and, and Spring Street. So if anybody has flooding in their basement around there, now you know why. <laughs> Great. And then Nancy's I think we've got another one. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, Nancy's hoping to see 62 Washington Street from a great great grandfather. Okay. Washington Street in Brighton. Okay. So we're looking at 1875 here. There it is, right? Is uh, seems like about the right spot. 
um, what was called Washington Street back then too. Uh, Nancy, I don't know if... Um, it looks like uh, we might have a correction to Cambridge Street rather than the oh, Washington Street. Cambridge Street, what was the number again? 62, yeah, 62. Cambridge Street. Um, I'm assuming Alston, um, since that was formerly a part of Brighton, perhaps. Um, though that can't be right. We're uh, we're looking right on the on the bridge here over into Cambridge. So this could be a case, Nancy, where 62 Washington is not called that anymore. Oh, or maybe I'm just searching it wrong. Uh, wait, those are 62 Cambridge. Sorry, I'm, I'm losing track of Cambridge, Brighton. Mm. So, so sometimes this address data is imperfect. Again, if they're if it's not totally sure where 62 Cambridge is today, if that's not a modern address. Um, but in any case, we're looking at uh, kind of an interesting thing here. You can see um, there's Murdoch Street where we we're just looking. Um, you can see a big estate here with a little pond in it, um, J.F. Hartwell's estate. And that pond now is got, uh, covered over by this street, which is Dustin Street. Um, so you can imagine the, the big estates, Henry Goodenough, the city owned a piece of land here, uh, all sorts of large kind of agricultural estates. Do we have some more addresses in the in the in the questions? We do. We have a few from Ellen, who's hoping to see 144 Kendrick in what appears to be Faneuil Square. Kendrick, um, Ellen, uh, the modern map doesn't seem to know where Kendrick Street is, unless uh, I don't know if it's spelled right. Um, so let's try Kenrick. I see Kenrick. There we go, Kendrick, not Kendrick. Um, okay, so here's here's 144 Kendrick. Um, there's Kendrick Street right there, going by Chandler Pond. Um, and looks like we're looking at an ice house. Um, I'm not familiar with this modern development uh, here, but there's, uh, there's clearly a modern development right here um, uh, developed over a pond, so similar to the part of the Chestnut Hill Reservoir that, that Ian was looking at before. Um, and you can see an ice house, which is another uh, common sort of agricultural edge type of use uh, in, in the 19th century city. Jamaica Pond very famously um, was used for ice harvesting, Fresh Pond in Cambridge, the same. Um, you're also no you, you may notice here that we're looking at the edge of an atlas. Um, so this is actually probably a Newton Atlas that we're looking on the very edge of into Brighton here. Um, since we're at the border of Brighton and Newton right here in this view, you see a lot of the atlases which we could look at are marked with edge, which means that we're, you know, two different maps are covering different parts of our view. Um, here's that same uh, place uh, in 1890s uh, that you can see the ice house, ice house here too, owned by Jeremiah Downing. Um, and let's jump to the newest, 1925. Yeah, still still an ice wow. house. Um, though you can see, this is actually quite interesting. You can see here, um, I'm just going to adjust my view a little bit, a planned parkway. That's, I don't know the history of that off the top of my head, but you can see this planned boulevard coming through here. Um, you see these dotted lines, boulevard, boulevard, Westbourne Boulevard. Um, I will confess I know nothing about the history of this planned Westbourne Boulevard from 1925, which was apparently not built. We'll have to look into that. Um, there's th This is a really interesting, I I've also always been fascinated by the ice trade in New England. And it's interesting to see that this ice house is still here in 1925 when modern refrigeration is beginning to, you know, devastate the the ice trade um, and make it pretty archaic in a lot of ways. Um, the Boston Ice Company, I believe, was founded by a guy named Frederick Tudor, who is from Boston and responsible for a whole lot of uh, international ice trade um, that spanned a lot of different trade circuits in the in the late 19th century. So 
it's a uh, it's always exciting to see little uh, little tidbits like that on on these kinds of maps. While we're here, I noticed that there's a nursery, the Nantum nursery on the other side of Kenrick. Um, you know, we're kind of getting some of the greatest hits of the the urban fringe um, in the you know early industrial era. Uh, modern day trucking and refrigerated transport and technologies like that have pushed the sort of urban rural interface farther away from the city. But of course, at this time, um, things like ice, like um, fresh meat, flowers, plants um, had to be located fairly close to the city. Um, and so a place like Brighton, of course, Ian alluded to earlier um, and, and mentioned uh, Andy Robichaud's excellent work um, it, 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 one, one of its really like core economic functions was to provide the city um, with some of those agricultural products. I see Ellen has another question about 158 Arlington. So let's, uh, let's maybe jump over there. Brighton, again, feel free anybody to, uh, to, to suggest places to look at and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so let me zoom out just a little bit here. Do, 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 do. Are we looking at about the right spot? Oh, there's Arlington's modern Arlington Street near the intersection of Faneuil. You can see Faneuil's here in 1875. And we're also, we're, we're again looking at a, a, a river course. So two little ponds here. Um, I don't know if this is the same water course uh, that we were looking at before. It looks like a different one that runs down northwards here to the Charles. Um, I would wager that if we were looking at a, uh, if we overlaid an elevation map of, of modern Boston, we'd probably be able to trace the route of this water course. And certainly if we were to overlay municipal sewer lines, often, oftentimes those sewer and stormwater lines follow the historic routes of, of, of things like, like this water course. The water wants to go downhill in today as much as it did in 1875. Um, we can we can do a little walk through time here on on Arlington Street. Here's another the heirs of John and Joseph Dunkley and George Livermore. It's another major estate. Let's see if we can figure out when it gets subdivided. Okay, so here in 1909, remember Ian was talking about how you can see the initial kind of speculation of a of a neighborhood. These these roads are being traced out, and 1916 they have been traced out. Um, and then 1925, that house is built. I can't, what, what were we looking at? 140, 158 was the question. So 158, these these street numbers, uh, numbers along the street center line are the, are the uh, addresses. So 158 Arlington in 1925 was owned by, by John O'Brien. So we've learned something about uh, that particular building. One of the, one of the cool things is, you know, if you wanted to know how old a building was, for instance, um, you might look at tax records as other sources you can go to, but certainly Atlas scope maps at least get you in the right direction. So here we know that 1916, that building wasn't there yet. 1925, it was there. So we've narrowed it down to nine years, essentially, uh, during which that building could possibly have been built. It looks like we have another address for searching. It's going to be 7 Nile Street, probably around 1925. All right. So here's Faneuil, Parsons. There's Niles, a dead end. Um, let's turn over to the modern aerial view. So we're somewhere close to here. Um, and in 1875, Surprise, surprise, it's still big, empty um, estates. There's a pond over here owned by Patrick Kinney. Um, what's that pond today? It looks like it's right at the edge of this field playground, which is McKinney Playground. So, hmm, interesting. I wonder if there's any relationship between Patrick Kinney and McKinney Playground. <laughs> Maybe it's just a, a sheer coincidence. Um, let's see if we can figure out when Seven Niles Street uh, appears on the map using that same kind of walking through time. 1899, Clark Smith, the heirs of Hiram Barker over here. It's very common to see a property go from somebody's name to somebody's heirs to development. Um, that's a common kind of course of events. So we could probably find Hiram Barker and then we assume Hiram Barker died and so passed to his heirs and then 
it's likely about to get developed. Yep, so 1916, see it's been laid out. There, apparently there was actually a plan to make a cross street here. See those dotted lines that run over. Um, good, is it good enough? Good no, good enough street. Um, not built. 1925. Seven Niles is still empty. So maybe it's just about A.H. Smith trustees are just about to sell this property and, and, and Seven will get developed at that time. Um, you know, it might be interesting to look at tax records, whether this right of way, this proposed uh, a road that was cutting across here um, still exists in people's deeds in this neighborhood. Um, clearly this playground wasn't built yet. Um, Looks like the Kennys and the McGoverns owned a bunch of property here. So as late as we get, we don't actually make it all the way to when McKinney Playground uh, was built. Any other questions for all of us, for Ian, Megan, anything, any of the other maps that, that Ian looked at? And I'll reiterate, I'll reiterate the maps, the maps that, that I, I showed us today were today today just a small selection of what's available in the digital collections and what we have in the uh, in the physical collections here. So please feel Let's free to explore those more. Um, I was going to say, sh oh, shall we bring Dove back uh, uh, briefly um, to talk about what's available at the Brighton branch of the Boston Public Library? Dove, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing you back, so get, get ready. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Garrett. Um, so the Brighton Library, as you might know, is right in the center of Brighton. Um, we have a small local history collection, a good sized one for a branch, um, and a few items on the history of Brighton proper. Um, most of the research can be done uh, at the Copley branch. And if you wanted to uh, ask questions for them, you just shoot an email to ask at bpl.org. Um, they also have a lot of online resources, um, digitized items, and uh, yeah, so that's basically it. Great, yeah, thanks for thanks for hosting us, Doug. You're welcome. Thank you. Sure. And as Ian mentioned before, our services at the Map Center again, we're not just a treasure trove of old maps. We do all sorts of research and education around maps and geography, um, and our services are free not only for uh, Boston residents, um, but for anyone, uh, Boston Public Library is the Library of the Commonwealth. Um, you're welcome to borrow from the BPL if you live in Massachusetts. Our rare collections do not circulate. You can't walk out of the building with them, but you can come and see them at any time by making a research appointment. Great. Well, if there aren't any more questions, Ian, I maybe lost your video again. <laughs> I'm not sure whose slow internet is to blame. Um, but uh, if there aren't any more questions, we'll, we'll wrap up our hour and uh, with a reminder that we'd love to get your feedback on today's event. We know that the internet <laughs> was a problem, but more generally how working with Atlascope and, and our historical collections online worked for you. Um, so we'll be circulating a, a, a very short feedback form for to, uh, to let you know to let us know what you'd like to see in future programs. Um, the recording of this video will also be up on our website by this evening. Um, so feel free to share it and refer back to it as a resource. Ian, I'll let you close out. Y Ian, you're, Ian, you're muted and I, ca I can't unmute you. <laughs> Sorry, thanks Garrett. Um... Uh, yeah, dealing with uh, some self-imposed technical difficulties as well. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for uh, joining us today, everybody. It was such a pleasure to walk through uh, all of these maps. And uh, we hope to see some of you here in person to visit for Bending Lines, uh, to visit our in-person collections. Um, please feel free to reach out uh, to any of us if you have uh, follow-up questions or would like to, to know more about what kinds of services we offer here at the Leventhal Center. Great. All right. Well, from all of us, thanks again and uh, have a nice rest of your day.